Many of you know, some of you might not, I have a really deep devotion to Our Lady of Fatima and everything that happened in Fatima, Portugal, just right at 107 years ago now. And so it's 1917, the midst of World War I, you know, there was an angel that appeared to three shepherd children there in rural Portugal, out in the middle of nowhere, kind of getting them ready. And then over a period from May until October, our Blessed Mother appeared to these shepherd children. It gradually gained a lot of attention. You had a lot of people that were completely believing this. You had some, including Venerable Lucia's mother, who still didn't believe her until she went to her grave. And you had atheists that mocked them. You had governments that are governments that wanted to stop them. In fact, the three children were arrested in August and missed their appointment with our Blessed Mother, and she appeared a few days later. And then finally, you get this big crescendo in October of 1917 on the 13th when 70,000 people showed up in this field where this had been happening, and they saw what's called the miracle of the sun. It had been a really rainy day. People were mocking them, saying it's not going to happen. Then all of a sudden, the sun starts dancing in the sky and shooting off rainbows, and it looks like it was crashing towards the earth. And everybody that was out there and was soaked from the rain suddenly... They're all dry, they're fine, and it's crazy how different everything is. But I'll tell you, I don't like going back to Portugal and visiting Fatima. I think I'm signed up to go again for, I think, the sixth time this coming February and taking several people with me. And it's not because there's a miracle of the sun, as cool as that is. And as I said, 70,000 people saw it. Even those that were mocking the kids had to say, yeah, something happened out there, it was crazy. But... When the sun was dancing around the sky and crashing to earth, it's not like it led to mass conversions and we just had world peace ever since, right? I go back because what our Blessed Mother was saying to those children had to do with loving her son more. She told them to pray the rosary every single day to make reparation for poor sinners, to love her son more and more. And basically it all boiled down to, as Sister Lucia, who lived until 2005, talked to Pope Benedict XVI, and she said to him, I think the whole message of Fatima boils down to, we need to grow in faith, hope, and love. And Pope Benedict said, I think you've got it exactly right. And you think about that, growing in faith, hope, and love. Doesn't sound all that exciting and crazy and all this, but at the same time, when we think about our own lives, it's the day-to-day -day experience of growing in relationships, right? It's not as though you meet someone once and it's just done, like, okay, we've got our great relationship, that's it. it. It grows with time more and more. And notice today what Jesus says, when the people, you know, understandably, they got fed last week, right? Or actually, it was yesterday by the gospel timeline. We miss a little bit. It's interesting, for, for five weeks in a row, we're in the sixth chapter of the gospel of John, and we skipped from verse 15 to verse 24 to get to this one. So all of a sudden, they're on the other side of the sea. They're in Capernaum. What happened in between the feeding of the 5,000 last week and this week was the disciples went off in the boat. Jesus was praying by himself. They were up against a big headwind. Jesus came walking on the sea. They were afraid. They see him walking on the sea. And he says, it's I. Don't be afraid. He gets in the boat. They're there. And then what happens now? Everybody comes looking for him, right? And they're looking for him. Why? As Jesus says, you're looking for me because you were filled. Don't just go for that passing, filling nature, right? Don't just go for the passing aspect of mere food. Now, granted... It's not as though our Lord is anti-food, right? Remember last week, he fed the 5,000. He gave them food to eat. But he's drawing them deeper and deeper in. He didn't come just to sort of like do a big sign and then that's it. And they say, you know, what do we have to do to get more, right? Because the way this sounds like, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? As he's kind of going through this, it's like, we want something more from you. What do we got to do to check the box? How am I going to get some more food? He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one, that's, the one who he sent. And that belief, it's an ongoing thing. It's something that grows day by day, right? Like I said, miracle of the sun, awesome. Kind of like shows the fact that, yes, this is from heaven. This is a big deal. But how is it that those little shepherd children became saints? Well, 
It's because of what I'm trying to pull out of my pocket without also pulling out my keys. It's the rosary, right? And why is the rosary so helpful? We're going through the mysteries of the life of Christ. We're remembering the facts that he has loved us, that he's entered into this with us. And he wants us to bring the mysteries of our life, to come together with the mysteries of his, and have our Blessed Mother teach us how that continues to unfold. And the fact of the matter is we know that it's something that's ongoing. There's nothing in this life that ultimately satisfies us, that ultimately what we want is to be madly in love, to be in relationship, to be in this communion. And the one who can give us, give us that love, give us that communion, give us that relationship, is the one who has come down from heaven, the one who is the bread of life. And so we have to continue to come to him day by day. And is that easy? No. To find that, you know, the belief in him, it's something that requires ongoing work. I'll tell you, one of my new favorite saints, I learned about not too long ago, St. Titus Bransma. He was a Carmelite monk. He was uh, very strong in the communications field. And he lived in the middle of the 20th century. He spoke out very strongly against the Nazis, which as we all know, they didn't take too kindly toward. So they arrested him, put him in a concentration camp, and then eventually he was sentenced to death. And the testimony of the nurse that injected him with the carbolic acid to end his life, she said that when he looked at her, he looked at me, she said, with such pity. Like, I, I will never be able to forget that look. Now, wait a second. The man being executed looked at the executioner thinking, you poor girl, why do you have to do this? I wish you could have my peace. And St. Titus Bransma said that prayer is not a mere oasis in the midst of the desert of life. Prayer is life itself. That our Lord is saying here, you know, what can you do to accomplish the works of God? Believe in the one he sent. And remember, belief isn't merely like, check, I believe in it, we're done, let's move on. It's not a mere intellectual ascent. It's a continual growing in a relationship, day by day, staying with him more and more. Now, okay, great father, another homily on telling us to pray. Really appreciate that, right? Like, yes, but the reason why I say that is because if all we're focused on is the mere stuff of this world, and let's be honest, it overwhelms us. It's, it's what we're thinking about all the time. Of course, our bellies, we get hungry pretty fast. But I think we all know inherently that that's not what will ultimately satisfy us. If it was, why would we be here right now? Like we would all be at IHOP, right? It's a better place to be on a Sunday morning if that's what we're looking for to just be filled up. Go have pancakes, not the little cracker I'm gonna give you, if that's all that it is, right? But he gives us so much more. And I would say this too, especially in the midst of the Olympic Games that are going on right now. It's fun to watch. I watched the 50 meter, okay, I'm not a great athlete at all, but I watched some, some this week with my nieces and nephews, my sister, the 50 meter, is it freestyle swimming? And like from first place to eighth place, it wasn't even a half second difference. Those guys were insanely fast. Like it was awesome to watch that. But I'll tell you this too, I've read that gold medal Olympic athletes are some of the most depressed people in the world. And you know why? It's like they've given everything for that 50 meter freestyle and I did it for 21 seconds, right? And now it's done, right? Or you could even be Michael Phelps and have 47 gold medals or how many he has, and yet he's not in this games, right? It's, it comes to an end. It doesn't keep going. And I do want to say one more aside. I'm sorry, it's a tangential-filled homily. But you know, the big opening ceremony, I just feel like, let's just address that, right? It's ridiculous. But I will say this, it reminded me of Fulton J. Sheen at St. Patrick's Cathedral one time. He's giving a homily, and this woman stands up. She's like, there is no God, da 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 goes on and on. And, and Archbishop Sheen pauses his homily. He's like, ma'am, let me ask you a question. He goes, do you go out in Central Park and rail against the boogeyman? No. Well, why not? Well, there is no boogeyman. And he said, exactly. I don't know why you're doing this now. And her response was, I hate you. You know, and it, I love it when you hear Fulton Sheen say that. Why do I bring that up? You don't mock something that's not relevant, right? You don't mock something that is not worth your time to talk about. Okay, big deal. Great. The Olympics, they mocked our Lord. Guess what? 
He's with us. Here he is all the time, giving us the bread of life, giving us that which will satisfy us in a way that a gold medal never can. And in the same way that, yes, Jesus gave them food to eat last week. He's not saying food's not important. I'm not saying today that sports is not important. Yeah, get out there. I got to tell you, on my vacation a couple weeks ago, I was at Lake of the Ozarks. I got to go tubing for the first time in like 20 years. You know, like, like water skiing, but more lazy because you're laying on the ground. But like I was holding on to it. Eventually, my arms became jelly. But I did it. And for like three and a half minutes, and I was so proud of myself. And this is the bigger part. I did it for longer than my brother. And he's like three years younger than I am, right? It's probably the greatest athletic accomplishment I've had in like the latter part of my life. And it's huge. But let's be honest, it hasn't satisfied me to this point, right? Yeah, I'm glad I got to do it, the family time, the athletics, it was great, but why am I here? Why am I happy? Why do I keep going? Because our Lord is in this with us. He's giving us what? The bread of life, that which will ultimately sustain us. And so what I would say is we look at like what St. Titus Brandsma said, prayer is not merely an oasis in the desert of life, it's life itself. Now, I know we're not all monks. I know we're not all in the church all the time on our knees praying, but I think to figure out a way to keep our Lord in the midst of everything all the time. Of course, we got to have the priorities that he's given us, the precepts of the church. Be at Mass every Sunday. A soccer game is not as important as Mass, you know? Like, to be here is so important because a gold medal will not satisfy. Our Lord will. But even in the midst of that, from, from week to week, from Sunday to Sunday, had the chain that connects the Sunday to Sunday with the rosary to remember, oh yeah, our Lord has done this for us. And if you're thinking, Father, I got five under the age of 10, how in the world am I supposed to pray the rosary? Okay, you're gonna be in the car sometimes, right? Pray a decade every time you get in the car. And I will tell you this, I remember when I was at St. John the Baptist in Tryon, I recommend the same thing. Every time you're in the car, pray a decade of the rosary together as a family. And you, know, you hear sometimes like, we shouldn't bring our little kids to Mass. They don't listen. What made me so happy, a couple weeks later, one of the moms said, my three-year-old from the back seat said, Father said we have to play a decade. And I'm like, great, you know? And, and they did it, and they kept it going. And when you think to yourself, well, you know, it's not the full rosary. It's not as good. Think about this. If you say to your mom, like, yes, I would love to talk to you for 20 minutes every day, but today I only got time for a two-and-a-half-minute con- two conversation. She's not going to say, not worth it, don't even call. No, she wants to have that, right? Keep our Lord in the midst of everything. One final thing, like I said in this homily full of tangents, I know that sometimes it's awkward to bring the prayer in, to suggest it. Well, my sister and nieces and nephews just left yesterday. They were here for the last two weeks, which is why I sound tired, because I am. But we did a model rocket shoot-off on the soccer field the other day with some friends, and we hit 6 p.m., and on the inside, I had this struggle, right, where it's like, hey, we should pray the Angelus. And then part of like, no, I don't want to be inconvenient, this and that. And remember, I'm a Catholic priest, and I'm the one going, I shouldn't impose prayer, you know, what are we going to, no. And, and I'm literally, I mean, I'm wearing my clerics, and it's like, hey, everybody, let's pause and pray the Angelus. And guess what? We were happy to do it. We remember the fact that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word who is the bread of life. And my friends, remember, prayer is not a mere oasis in the desert of life. It is life itself. Yes, there are many wonderful things around us, but all of those things, if they're taken out of the right context, if food in our belly becomes our God, or the gold medal becomes our God, or fame and fortune become our God, we will be disappointed. But the glorious thing is, our Lord has come to show us that satisfaction is possible, that love is possible, and not just merely for this life, but into eternity. Let's be like the people in this gospel that say, Sir, give us this bread always. To bring him into everything. To remember he is the bread of life. And that bread of life wants to be a part of every moment of our lives. Praise be Jesus Christ.